Uh, good morning, please be seated. Just a couple of words before we actually begin the arguments. Um, first of all, I want to thank the University of Oregon Law School for hosting uh, this session of the Oregon Court of Appeals. We're greatly appreciative of it. It's uh, an opportunity for us to get out and, and uh, see people. We don't get out much as, uh, as, as judges. And uh, also, uh, I think, I hope, uh, a valuable educational experience for law students and members of the general public. Quickly, let me uh, ask my colleagues to introduce themselves so you have some idea of who we are, beginning with our most junior judge, Judge DeVore. Good morning. I'm Joel DeVore. I'm not sure how much more to say than that. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Judge DeVore has been a member of our court for um, a month, approximately. Yeah, I'm a University of Oregon graduate back in 1982, That's for right. a little more detail. That's right. Judge Hadlock. Hello, my name is Erica Hadlock. I have been on the Oregon Court of Appeals for about two and a half years. I graduated from Cornell Law School and Reed College, and also I'm very happy to be with you all today. And I'm David Schumann. I've been on the court since 2001. Um, I am not only a graduate of this law school, uh, I taught here for about nine years. And as a matter of fact, beginning next August, I will be teaching here again. When this argument is done, we will have an opportunity for questions and answers. We have uh, three courses, three court, three cases to hear this morning, so we won't have endless questions and answers, but we will have uh, as many as we have time for. That being said, uh, our first case on the docket is Chernak versus Kitzhopper. Good morning. May it please the court, Tanya Sanerup on behalf of plaintiffs, and I have with me today Kelsey and Olivia. We'd like to thank the panel for traveling down to Eugene this morning and the University of Oregon for hosting us. I'd like to reserve five minutes of my time for rebuttal. Your Honors, we're here today because the other branches of government are failing to protect the rights of youth in this room from the devastating impacts of climate change and to essential natural resources in Oregon. The next generation requires the aid of this court to enforce the public trust doctrine and the minimum floor it sets for protection of Oregon's resources. The aspirational, non-binding statutory law defendants use as their defense does not alleviate the need for court intervention to ensure that the executive faithfully executes its common law and constitutional obligations to plaintiffs. You mentioned, or you mentioned in your introductory sentence, the public trust doctrine. Um, how do we know what the contents of that doctrine, uh, what the contours of that doctrine are? It's referred to, as, as the state concedes, in, in a lot of federal and Oregon law, but nowhere do we see the kind of specificity that we would see in a traditional trust. So how do we know what it means, and what it includes, and what it doesn't include? Well, Your Honor, I think the best place to start for that is looking back to Oregon case law. And here in Oregon, our public trust doctrine is a common law doctrine, and that doctrine has been reflected in our Constitution and in statutory law. But if you look back to cases such as the Corvallis Sand and Gravel case, you see the judiciary articulation of the public trust doctrine, the resources that it protects, the uses of those resources that it protects, and that it places a floor upon which we cannot go with our natural resources. And that floor is substantial impairment or complete alienation of lost resources. And that floor is why we are here today. We have in Oregon several different statutes um, that regulate our water, which is a recognized trust resource. We have Oregon's Global Warming Statute, which is designed to start to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in our state. But we are at the point where we are seeing substantial impairment of these essential resources, and that is when the public trust doctrine comes into play. Those standards 
that this court can use are articulated in early cases, in more recent cases. But at the end of the day, it is up to the judiciary to decide how to mold and how to craft the common law in Oregon. And, to, and today, the youth have come to court and asked you to do just that. So the court could decide that in order to protect the, the, state's, the state's natural resources, uh, the, 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 the state, in either the form of its governor or an agency or the legislature, uh, had to ban the use of all internal combustion engines before 2015. Could would that be would that be something within our authority under the public trust doctrine? Your Honor, I think it's important that we clarify exactly. Um, how we conceptualize the public trust doctrine working. And it's analogous to any other trust. So if, for example, someone had set up a college fund for Kelsey and Olivia, put $400 in it, a year later there's only $200. If it's a validly administered and set up trust, we come to court and say, we don't think we're going to have a college fund. We're down to $200. And the court wouldn't be left deciding what stocks should be invested in to get these girls a college fund. The court instead would order the trustee to provide an accounting and to provide a plan to generate the college fund for these girls. This, in this situation, it is no different. We are not asking the judiciary to step in and come up with solutions to climate change in Oregon. Instead, what we're asking the court to do is to order the executive to do that. And the executive has the tools and they have the capacity to do that. And when they come back with an accounting, they come back with a plan, then this court will be in a position, as it is in many other cases, with the aid of expert testimony, to be able to determine whether or not that plan is sufficient. How, do, how, does, the, how does the executive have, have the authority to do what the complaint in this case asks the, the state to do? Well, Your Honor, the executive is bound by the common law and by the public trust doctrine, which says it must prevent substantial impairment of trust resources, and that provides the executive with the authority to act. But does the executive have the authority to say that the state must reduce carbon emissions by 6% per year until 2050? Absolutely. Or, Absolutely. Really? Why, why wouldn't that be a legislative decision? The legislature could also make a decision along those lines without a doubt, and the legislature has acted. We have a global warming statute here in Oregon, but that statutory law does not negate the need for action under the common law when we get to the point of substantial impairment. I mean, the public trust doctrine functions like an umbrella insurance policy. It fills in the gaps to the statutory law. And so global, the global warming statute has goals, those goals um, under current climate science are inadequate to protect Oregon's resources. But even if, and the state isn't on track to meet those goals, but even if it were, it wouldn't be sufficient. And that's where the common law comes into play and says we cannot go below substantial impairment. Now we're here today on a motion to dismiss. And so I want to remind the court that while we would love to discuss these issues, we want to have exactly that opportunity to go back to the trial court and do oh, that. If you hadn't reminded us of that, I was going to remind you of that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about why the trial court does have jurisdiction to hear this case. And I think we can start with Oregon's Declaratory Judgment Act. And um, last week, the state submitted a supplemental memo with the Hale case. And as we said in our response to that, we think that that case helps us in this instance and demonstrates why plaintiffs have presented a justiciable controversy um, that can be resolved by the court system here. And first of all, I want to point out one of our common themes throughout plaintiffs' assignments of error is the need to look at their complaint as a whole in its entirety. And if you look at the trial court's decision, if you look at defendants' briefing, they rely on small segments of the request for relief in this case to argue that the court doesn't have jurisdiction to resolve this matter. Counsel, when you argued to the trial court, did anybody alert the trial court to the possibility that even if the parts of the complaint that requested very specific injunctive relief were non-justiciable because they would create separation of powers problems. The bare request for a declaration, for example, I think in paragraph 49 and, and around there, 
that nonetheless a the trial court could issue a declaration on those matters even if it could not go so far as to issue the additional injunctive relief the plaintiffs requested? Your Honor, yes. That, I believe that that issue was preserved below and it's in our briefing on the Declaratory Judgment Act before the trial court mm -hmm. um, and it also came up um, in the context of our briefing. Plaintiffs made it clear in their response brief below that the court needed to consider the entirety of the pleadings and pointed out throughout its brief instances where defendants were relying on small portions of the relief requested to make their argument, when in reality they needed to look at the entire pleadings. Um, and as you just alluded to, we believe that at a bare minimum this court has jurisdiction to issue the declarations that are requested by this by plaintiffs in this matter, by the youth here. I think the, I think the argument that, that the state is making has more to do with just, on, on that issue, has more to do with justiciability than with jurisdiction, by which I mean uh, the, state, the state's position seems to be that the mere issuing of a, of a declaration or a judgment declaring that there is a trust, public trust doctrine, et cetera, et cetera, would not provide any tangible, concrete, non relief to the plaintiffs in this case. Your response? Your Honor, we respectfully disagree with that position that defendants are taking. And I think that your, your opinion in the Hale decision really discusses why that is um, it's untrue. You cited to the Brown v. Board of Education decision. And obviously, I think everyone who's an attorney acknowledges that declaratory relief has ramifications beyond just the parties before the court. But in addition to that, if this court were to declare that the executive, that Governor Kitzhopper, is allowing substantial impairment of trust resources, we assume the governor will faithfully execute the law, that he will take action as a result of that declaratory judgment, that it will have impacts on the ground. And I don't see anything from defendants to indicate otherwise. So I'm still a little confused about why you chose the governor as a defendant in this case. And what you seem, what you seem to be arguing is that the governor by himself could, could issue an order compelling certain actions uh, without any legislative intervention. Um, now, we know that there are state agencies, there are state agencies that can do that under del delegated authority, statutory delegated authority. Um, I don't think we have any cases talking about how an agency can do that under authority delegated by the common law. So I'm still a little, a little curious about, about what, the, what the governor could do and whether or not you are asking us to compel the governor to do something that is itself un unconstitutional. I see that I'm out of time. May I answer your question? Yeah, uh, yes. Is this, she has two minutes? I never saw the white light. Yeah, she has the red light on. Red light on. I think uh, with the permission of my colleagues, um, we will extend, we will extend uh, the party's time by, by 10 minutes each. Can we do that? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so the answer to your question, why, why Governor Kitzhopper, it, I would give you three responses. First of all, the governor does have the authority to issue executive orders. And so he has his own um, authority to be able to act upon these issues. He is the head of the executive. He can work with the heads of administrative agencies here in Oregon to um, implement additional measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in our state. And as defendants acknowledge, he also can recommend legislation to the legislature. And so he stands in a unique position in our state to be able to best address these issues, to best corral the executive and make recommendations to the legislature on how to ensure that Oregon prevents substantial impairment of our trust resources. So a declaration from this court that substantial impairment is occurring would provide redress to the injuries plaintiffs have put before you. And it would be a declaration of their rights and the rights of the next generation to these resources. And I think that the Hale decision helps describe why, in fact, even just bare bones declaratory relief would be useful. In addition, we think that the court obviously has the authority to also order an accounting of resources and has the ability to order the executive to prepare a plan to protect trust resources. And that doesn't require 
in essence, the court be striking down our global warming statute. It just means that the executive needs to ensure additional measures are implemented. And the benefit of having a global warming statute in this context is we already have from the state, from the executive, plans and measures that have been identified to address these issues. And we're here today on behalf of these youth asking you to order the government to do more to protect their future. When we get to this point of substantial impairment, that's when the public can call upon the judiciary to ask for help. Counsel, you invoke terms like accounting that arise out of what we think of as ordinary trust law. And of course, the public trust doctrine incorporates that word trust. But other than that uh, use of the term trust in the name of the common law doctrine that has developed over the years, what, what would you ask us to look to to find that ordinary trust principles apply in this situation? I think that some of um, the early decisions here in Oregon, so the Corvallis Sand and Gravel decision, um, the um, Brusco Tobo decision, they, in those instances, the court really talks about the sovereign's obligations to the public and how it has to hold these essential natural resources in trust and that it serves as a trustee of these resources and it has to protect the uses that the beneficiaries of the trust rely upon. And so I think that that early language and that exploration of how did the public trust doctrine come to Oregon, what are its origins, and it came to us from England, originally from Roman law, I think that will provide useful guidance in recognizing that while it is a public trust doctrine, um, while it's broad and it encompasses many resources, it's not dissimilar to any other trust situation. And here the next generation, they are the beneficiaries of that trust. They stand the most to lose. And they're calling upon this court to, to take action on these issues. Has, has the Oregon court, or for that matter, any court, um, the state, of the, well, I'll put it this way, the state asserts in its brief that neither the Oregon court nor any other court has ever used the public trust doctrine to impose an affirmative obligation on the state as trustee to perform a particular act on behalf of a private citizen. Is that, is that a correct statement or is that incorrect? Would we be the first? The public trust doctrine has been raised by the public in actions against the executive prior to this case. So this is not a, a Successfully? Unique. Um, oftentimes, I would say courts resolve the issues on other grounds. So th it, this case is unique in that we are actually putting before you just the common law, just the public trust doctrine. But like any trust, I think it's important to recognize we wouldn't have a public trust doctrine if the beneficiaries of that trust, if the youth here today, didn't have an opportunity to enforce it. What would the doctrine mean if it was only up to the government to be able to take action on and so I think that's a really, really important concept for you to hold in your minds as you resolve this case. Um, I also think it's important to step back from this and take a look at it in the context that the public trust doctrine has been utilized by the public in seeking further action from the executive. It's also been used by the executive to halt actions by private parties. And so any decision from this court will have ramifications for the ability of the beneficiary to enforce the trust, but also ability of the trustee to enforce that trust. And I think it's important that we tread lightly here because we really do hold Oregon's public trust doctrine in our hands. Council, yeah. plaintiffs have cited the, with additional authorities, the uh, Pennsylvania case, uh, Robinson Township, Pennsylvania employing in its constitution an environmental rights amendment yes. with trust language in it and their court acting, enforcing its constitution. Does that, if Oregon had an amendment in its constitution like Pennsylvania, like that, would that help you with the state's arguments about separation of powers? Or would that be totally unnecessary because, in your view, the common law doctrine of public trust is the equivalent of a constitutional amendment already? 
Your Honor, the latter. In our view, the common law doctrine is equivalent to a constitutional provision. And certainly our Constitution contains not an environmental rights amendment as um, the Pennsylvania Constitution does, but it has a basic statement of the rights of all citizens of Oregon that is completely analogous to the statement in um, Pennsylvania's Constitution. And I think the court in, in the Pennsylvania case is clear at saying, you know, we really are talking about a declaration of rights. We don't even need this environmental rights amendment to get into the public trust doctrine. It's functioning, and the floor it sets for the executive, but they can't go beyond substantial does, impairment. Does the, does the judiciary have, have the authority to strike down legislative action or to compel legislative action um, without some sort of a constitutional foundation? Yes, it does. Um, and, but I, I want to be very clear, we are not in this instance challenging Oregon's global warming statute. Um, that statute is out there, it exists. What this case is about is about the executive's common law obligation and the need for the governor to prevent substantial impairment of natural resources, separate and apart from any statutory law. And I think that the decision from California, the National Audubon Society case, is really helpful in grappling with these issues because the court there had statutory law, it had common law, and it was figuring out a way forward. And the court said, we need to provide guidance for the executive. How do you deal with these two competing bodies of law? But the question isn't, or it, does one cancel out the other? The question before the court is, how can we provide guidance to the executive to faithfully execute all of our laws, not just our statutory laws? So when you want the court to provide guidance to the executive to faithfully execute all laws, how would this court or any court decide that the public trust doctrine trumps other provisions, even in the Oregon Constitution, that require the state to, to give priority to certain other principles, for example, you rely partly in your formation or your articulation of the public trust doctrine on Article 8, Section 8 of the Oregon Constitution, but Article 8 also contains the provision that says that the state shall manage lands uh, with the object that the, the um, with the object of obtaining the greatest benefit for the people of the state, and I'm sorry, that's in section 5.2, but section 8, of course, the, stat the provision that was at issue in the Pendleton School District case mm -hmm. requires the state to adequately fund schools or explain why it has not done so. So if we were to say that the public trust doctrine requires the state to manage lands for conservation principles, how would what, would, what would require, what principle would allow this court to tell the state that it was required to take certain actions because of the public trust doctrine as partly reflected in that constitutional provision, even though other constitutional provisions like the school funding provision might suggest, at least to some people, uh, that state man land should be managed in a different way. Your Honor, I think the, where I would disagree with, your, with your, your characterization of this issue is we're not saying that the public trust doctrine trumps any other requirements. We're saying that it is another legal obligation that the executive has to balance. And I think that that's where the decision from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court is particularly helpful. It says in addition to funding our schools, in addition to managing state lands for the greatest benefit, the executive also needs to ensure that it doesn't allow substantial impairment of the trust resources provided by those state lands. So it's not saying that you have to have one over the other, and this court has to decide which one to choose. Instead, the answer is provide guidance for the executive on how to best balance all of those competing legal obligations. Okay, and the, you're, you're a little bit into your rebuttal time, okay. but um, I can tell you that on rebuttal I'm going to ask you why is, it an, why is it a judicial or an executive function to prioritize competing, competing interests and competing needs? 
as opposed to a legislative function. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Fjordbeck. May it please the court, Denise Fjordbeck on behalf of the governor and the state. And with me here this morning is Paul Garahan of our general counsel division. Everyone interested in public policy in Oregon would acknowledge that climate change is a serious problem and that it has to be dealt with. The legislature, the governor, and the attorney general have all devoted considerable time and effort within their respective spheres to work toward a resolution of that problem. The issue in this case is where the necessary law and policy discussion should take place. In a representative democracy, the answer to that question is the legislature, with input from the governor and the executive branch, or in the alternative through the initiative process, uh, but not through policy generated and not implemented by this court. And, and yet uh, we see, at least in, in federal courts, we see situations in which the court will impose, for example, a very detailed um, busing, busing schedule and protocol uh, for cities to, to, to undertake, or um, mandate, courts will mandate that certain federal prisons have to have mattresses that are three inches thick and light bulbs that, that, that produce a given amount of lumens. Why can't, how does this case differ from that? Well, with regard to the, the segregation situation, those very detailed decisions came only after, um, many years after the court had indicated that constitutional rights were being violated, that were specific constitutional provisions guaranteeing uh, racial equality were being consistently violated, and a, a pattern of uh, unwillingness and, and um, inability to conform to those prior court decrees. Only at that point um, did the court then step in affirmatively to impose uh, any kind of affirmative action by the government. We're far from that point. The legislature and the governor have taken action and will continue to take action on this issue without any uh, direction from the court. With regard to the operation of prisons, uh, I would submit to the court that there is also a great deal of case law that specifically says that it is not the province of the courts to micromanage the prisons. Uh, it is the province of the court to, to direct um, in general terms that there shall be no cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, but, but typically the day-to-day -day operation of those penal institutions in the absence, again, of of consistent, systematic, and willful violations of constitutional law uh, is, is not something that, that is allowed. <clears throat> I'd like to clarify what, what the state's position in, is in this matter and also what is and is not at issue. The state has never taken the position in this litigation that there is no public trust in the atmosphere. Rather, the parties to this litigation specifically agreed at the trial court that the applicability and the scope of the public trust doctrine would be left for another day. What, what, did, uh, what did everybody mean by scope, the scope of the, of the public trust doctrine? Assuming that the public trust doctrine applies to the atmosphere, and we do assume okay. that for purposes of this, you would still have to determine exactly what that means. One, one example of what that might mean might be your example of completely banning internal combustion engines. Certainly, we could accomplish a great deal for climate change if we did that, um, but, but that is um, obviously a, a drastic remedy. It's, a, it's an issue of public policy. So when, when, when the parties agreed not to, uh, not to litigate the scope of the public trust doctrine, that didn't include an agreement with respect to uh, the power of the judiciary to, to enforce the public trust doctrine, obviously. And that's, no. that could be seen as, as, as the scope. But I, think, I think you've answered my question. I think I understand. Yeah, I, 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 our point for this, for purposes of this argument, is simply that the, the parties did not brief and did not argue to the trial court 
and have not preserved in this court the issue of whether there is or is not an application of public trust here. We left that for another day. We took up the threshold question of whether the public, whether the complaint that was filed was justiciable. But counsel, it, what I'm having trouble with is understanding how the state's arguments in this case can be reconciled with the Supreme Court's decision in the Pendleton School District case. The argument that no relief, no affirmative relief could be granted in this case in terms of the specific injunctions that plaintiff requested such as an order requiring defendants to develop and implement a carbon reduction plan uh, seems in tension with the Supreme Court's holding in Pendleton that the plaintiffs in that case were entitled to a declaration about what Article 8, Section 8 required in terms of adequate funding, even though the plaintiffs were not entitled to an injunction requiring the state to take any particular action. So how, how does your argument fit with Pendleton in that regard? Well, I, I would say this about Pendleton. In that case, the court was uh, construing a specific um, provision of the Constitution, which, you know, it frankly is a rather pedestrian exercise of judicial power, as opposed to um, both, you know, being asked to declare what, what, that there is a public trust, and then to judicially determine in its entirety what the scope of that is, and then how, how that should be implemented. But in <clears throat> Pendleton, again, the declaration to which plaintiffs were entitled was that, at least in part, that the legislature, the, the courts may grant a declaratory judgment that the legislature failed to fully fund the public school system, if that was the case. And elsewhere in the opinion, the court talks about the Supreme Court or other courts being able to issue a declaration regarding what, if anything, Article 8, Section 8 required in terms of imposing an obligation on the state to fully fund schools. So why isn't that analogous to what plaintiffs request here, which is in part a declaration that certain provisions in the Constitution as well as common law and statutory provisions uh, impose certain obligations on the state and to have a declaration to that effect or perhaps a declaration that those provisions do not so oblige the state? Because the party specifically agreed at the trial court level that that was not something that was going to be decided. In other words, we were not going to talk about what, whether, whether the public trust doctrine applied or how far it went. Um, the, the plaintiffs didn't have to make that agreement, but they did. And, and now they've essentially said, no, even though we agreed before that the court was not going to address that, that we want that issue addressed. Well, let me clarify. So, I thought the agreement was that the parties were not litigating at this point. The issue before the court is not whether the state is under that obligation. The question is only before us is whether only whether a court can announce whether the state has such an obligation. And the argument that the state does not have such an obligation because the state in terms of the executive does not have such an obligation or that the court cannot announce that seems to depend on, let me start over, Your, the state's argument that the judiciary cannot announce whether 
the executive has such an obligation because that would violate separation of powers principles appears to assume, to rely on the assumption that in fact the executive has no such obligation. Because if the executive did have such an obligation, wouldn't this case become like Pendleton? I'm not sure I'm, I'm completely tracking your And question. I can understand that. <laughs> um. So in Pendleton, the Supreme Court said, there is a constitutional provision that yes. the plaintiffs have pointed to. The courts can announce in a declaratory judgment action whether that constitutional provision obliges the state to fund schools at a certain, at an adequate level. Here, plaintiffs are saying there is a constitutional provision along with other principles that oblige the state to do certain things. Why in this case would it not be appropriate for a court to announce whether or not that is true? I think the difference with this case is, is what, what the certain things are. And I think the Pendleton case is actually helpful because the court was able to make a declaration of what the law is. That, that that constitutional provision requires adequate funding and that the funding provided heretofore has not been adequate. What, what the Pendleton case also stands for is that the judiciary then doesn't go beyond that point and, and tell the legislature, excuse me, my, my voice is a little rough this morning. We noticed. Yes, um, tell the legislature specifically then what to do to redress that. And that really, the argument that, that was made below was that the public trust doctrine, um, as, and, and again, we all assumed that it applied, required that, that certain specific steps be taken and that the judiciary, as opposed to some other branch of government, would decide based on some, some kind of evidence, best scientific evidence apparently, um, what those steps should be, who should take them, how they should be taken, what industries they should fall on, whether some industries should be exempt, all of those kinds of questions that are fundamentally legislative questions. Um, certainly they're, they are um, they're, they're public policy questions, but they are also political questions that, uh, quite frankly, are not judicially knowable. Um, they, they are um, questions that, that typically would be decided after legislative hearings with input from the governor, with uh, input from the public, uh, and then uh, subject to legislative action. But they're, they're not something that this court um, would have the, uh, I, you know, I hesitate to say power because the court certainly has plenty of that, but that in a, in a three-part uh, system of government that the court should exercise that authority. Counsel, let me ask about that part of the trial court's opinion that began with the, I'll call it, observation that uh, what the plaintiffs were asking here would add a new duty or add a new dimension to uh, what the public trust doctrine might be. That is, all, despite the tacit under, uh, agreement between the parties that we're not going to really argue the scope of the public trust doctrine, the trial judge made that observation that this would impose something new. And that's assigned as error, that argument or that observation is assigned as error. Is that observation about whether, well first, was it, was that contrary to the agreement of the parties not to talk about the public trust doctrine or um, can, you, can you help us with that? It is, was the, what I'm trying to get at is was that necessary to the conclusions about separation of powers or justiciability or political question which were the state's defenses? Was that observation? Could, th could that be dispensed with and still reach your arguments 
your defenses? Yeah, yes. The, the short answer is, is yes, that it makes no difference to the separation of powers or political question arguments. The, um, I think the trial judge was alluding to the fact that the scope of, of this, to the extent that there is a public trust in the atmosphere, that it's not been delineated where the contours of that is. It's new in that sense. Um, to the extent that the public trust doctrine arises from the common law, in some sense it has always existed. And so um, it, it, you know, it, even though we don't know what it is, it exists, it's out there. It's not new in that sense, but it is something that, that, that has not been delineated as yet. And I think that, that Judge Rasmussen was merely recognizing the fact that uh, it, it's not something that has been filled out or, or filled in, in in the way, for example, that the public trust as to uh, navigable waterways has been um, discussed and, and the interstices have been filled in over the years. In that sense, it was new. But, but the, the point on um, separation of powers is, is really twofold. Um, first, that what the court is being asked to do here, which is to um, order an annual accounting of CO2 emissions, to order a carbon reduction plan based on the best available science, and to order a reduction of greenhouse gases by 6% per year is something that you would typically see in legislation to be ordered by the legislature. It's a legislative function. It's a violation of separation of powers because it would have this court um, usurp that legislative function. Um, the, the petitioners seek to have the court essentially impose that by decree rather than through exercise of the legislative power. And I would, I would disagree with opposing counsel that, that that doesn't place an undue burden on the legislative branch because it, it would in effect usurp uh, and excise the policy choices that the legislature has already made and policy choices that, that they may make as early as next month going forward in dealing with this issue by imposing a judicial decree, they would, it would foreclose the legislature's opportunities to do something, it seems to me, uh, different, to approach it in a different way, um, to weigh the economic and social issues, to determine what industries the, the burden should fall on and where should they should not fall. Um, those are all you know, fundamentally uh, legislative choices, clearly with input from the executive branch, and then implementation by the executive branch. But what, what the petitioners have asked for is that this court make those policy choices and then by exercising continuing jurisdiction oversee the implementation of that, that policy choice. And, and that really is the, the exercise of, of power that is beyond the judicial power that our uh, Constitution grants to the judicial branch. Um, the, 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 uh, these policy choices are not judicially knowable in the sense that there is no right answer. It's not, it's not a matter of um, the court hears evidence and makes a finding as to what, what is or is not the correct answer. There are simply too many moving parts. Um, Oregon is obviously only a part of the problem. Uh, different Oregon industries and consumers contribute differently. Solving the problem will require uh, weighing and balancing of uh, different economic uh, results, different effects on different people. We'll have results for, for jobs, um, those are simply not decisions that, that are uh, decisions that, that one trial judge, and, and as, as Judge Rasmussen observed, one trial judge in one of 36 counties uh, 
uh, should be making for the state. And if the Supreme Court makes decisions, and the Supreme Court make, makes decisions that uh, have an effect statewide. Certainly. Council, if the Oregon Constitution included a provision that said that the state shall manage its resources so as to um, so as to most effectively combat global warming and shall prepare a report to be submitted to the legislature explaining each year what it has done to accomplish that and whether it has been successful and if not, why not, would you be making the same art separation of powers arguments here today? Probably not, and here's why. We would then have something against which the court could measure performance. In other words, the court could, as it did in Pendleton, say, legislature, you're not doing what, what this, you're demonstrably not implementing the most effective policy. Um, so then... But the court couldn't then go the, the, the step further and say, and here's the policy you shall implement instead. But then to find that there is a separation of powers problem here, don't we have to assume that the public trust doctrine does not essentially contain the same principle as I just hypothesized for that non-existent constitutional provision? The, the public trust doctrine, as it's been articulated to date, says in essence that the, the, the state may not alienate or substantially impair trust assets. And um, the case law around it, though, has really concentrated on the, the alienation piece. In other words, um, the state has a, a public trust in a riverbed. The state could not decide tomorrow that uh, we're going to sell the Willamette Riverbed to private parties and completely alienate the state's interest in that trust. However, the courts have been clear that short of that, the state can allow filling, the state can allow wharving, the state can allow any manner of private uses of that public resource. The, the exact scope, short of alienation, of what the state can do is a subject of legislative action. Uh, and the, the cases that we've cited in our brief on pages 12 and 13 discuss that, that application of the public trust doctrine. And so to say, if, if there were a constitutional amendment that were to say that um, you have to elevate global warming above other policy issues, such as economic and social considerations, and you have to use the most effective means, then that would be a, a major shift in how this court and the, the Supreme Court have treated public trust in the past. Um, short of complete, a, complete abrogation from the sphere, which the legislature certainly has not done. They have been very active in, in regulation um, of, of air quality and in regulation of greenhouse gases. But short, short of doing absolutely nothing, it is, is not for this court to direct what specific steps should be taken. It's for the legislature to do that. Counsel. This court could declare that the legislature is not doing enough, needs to do more, but, I, but, but that's all it can do. Yes, Judge DeVore. Well, that, that was my next question, uh, because the fallback position of petitioners is, well, if we can't get relief, then at least say that uh, that there's been a breach of the public trust. And, um, and, and there's also the argument that uh, petitioners are not challenging the existing statutes, um, merely seeking something that's complementary. And I'm wondering what, and I would ask them to explain that a little bit on reply when they come, but before they do, I'd ask you the very same question about how, how does that, is that complementary if the court were to act and say, 
um, there is a breach of the, the public duty. More needs to be done. Um, is, is that complementary to where the legislature has gone so far with non-mandatory standards, 10% by the year 2020? Um, has the legislature made a policy choice going that far and no further? And is the court implicitly uh, saying something contrary that the legislature hasn't done enough? Is that contrary or is that complementary? Well, I don't think you can say that it's complimentary. I'm afraid you, I'm going to have to ask you to make a, a, quite a short answer since your red light is on. But you can. Well, uh, I, I, I would say that, that to us it appears to clearly conflict. We have legislative standards. We have a decision that those standards at this point are not mandatory, although that the legislature can, certainly can change that. And imposing a by court decree a mandatory standard would be very different. Thank you. Thank you. Rebuttal. How much time um, does Ms. Two point five. Thank you. In answer to your question, Your Honor, um, the reason that the governor and the executive are before the court today as defendants is because the governor is charged under our Constitution with faithful execution of Oregon laws. The public trust doctrine provides a floor, substantial impairment against which our natural resources are not to dip below. It's the court's job to declare the law, and we assume that the executive and legislative branches will follow that declaration. Has there ever, can, can, has there ever been a situation in which the court ordered the governor to, to, to take particular actions um, in order to avoid violating the common law? Uh, uh, we know that courts do that with respect to the Constitution all the time, since Marbury versus Madison. But do they do that with respect to the, common, to the common law as well? I can't think of a particular case in from Oregon in which that has occurred. But again, the executive, the governor, has this obligation to faithfully execute all of our laws, not just our constitution. But my, 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 point, you know, my point is that, generally speaking, the law that the, the, law that the governor executes is statutory law uh, or, or administrative law. And our authority to, uh, to, com to compel him or to try to compel him to do that stems from our duty to see to it that the Constitution is, is, is followed. But I have a, I have a, I have a, a sort of a, a follow-up question <coughs> or a, a somewhat different question. And this, at least, at least in, in my mind, this goes, to, this goes to what I think is the core of, of what this case is about. Separation of powers, the separation of powers argument I think that the state is making is that what the plaintiffs want us as the judiciary, as the judiciary to do in this case is the core, is to, is to perform the core legislative function, which is to prioritize expenditures, to mediate between or ag aggregate votes in favor or against uh, particular, particular policies. Um, how, do we, how do we get that authority? How do we get that authority? Well, first of all, this court obviously has the authority under Oregon's Declaratory Judgment Act to declare the law. And I think the arguments that defendants make ignores those requests for declarations in plaintiffs' requests for relief. Their concerns are with the further requests for relief. And as much as I hate to confess this, I've represented a lot of plaintiffs, and they don't often get all their requests for relief. If some of those requests are troubling, the court can decide at a later date to issue other relief. But we knew going into court that we needed to provide an articulation of exactly what we wanted to have happen, because otherwise we would be here on these same issues in a different posture. Um, may I briefly conclude? I see that I'm out of time, but I'd like to just give a very brief, very brief conclusion. Your Honors, this is not the first time in history that courts are being called upon to solve an issue that the other branches of government lack the will to address. We ask you to enforce the rights of the youth in this courtroom today and protect their futures. Thank you. Thank you. That's the end of this particular oral argument. Um, as is our custom when we visit the, uh, you know, the uh, law schools or the high schools in, in the state, uh, we, will, uh, we will entertain questions from, uh, from the audience. I have to explain that probably the questions that you want to ask most are precisely the questions that we can't answer.